We'll, we'll get going and, and thank you. Thank you all again. Um, we're going to start off. Thank you for everybody who's here today and especially to our four panelists. My name is Matoi Monroe and I'm the co-leader of United American Indians of New England. Um, and I'm speaking to you today from the shared territory of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc people. And that is of course, stolen unceded territory. This year in tandem with the North American Indian Center of Boston, we are presenting an Indigenous Liberation series of webinars. In January, we presented a powerful panel on the need to pass Indigenous-centered legislation in Massachusetts. And we're going to talk to you a little bit more about that at the very end of the program, too, because we want everybody to help support that legislation. In February, in honor of Black History Month, we had Professor Kyle Mays as our featured speaker, and he's the author of um, an Afro-Indigenous People's History of the United States, a book that we recommend to everybody. This month, our panel is, is on Indigenous women in leadership, and we're really excited to have our four speakers with us here today. Uh, we're going to uh, run this panel in, in a certain way, which is going to be that um, each of the panelists will make initial remarks and then we'll start asking questions. I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions for them and lots of discussions. So we're really looking forward to that as well. Why are we doing this panel in March? It's because March 8th commemorates International Women's Day, which honors the struggles of women around the world for justice, revolutionary change, improved working conditions, dignity, and respect. International Women's Day has its roots in the fight of garment workers in New York City more than a century ago, beginning in 1908, who went on strike and marched to protest their brutal working conditions. And these were conditions that were all too lethal for many, including the 146 garment workers who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. I say this because I myself am, was a labor organizer. So I think it's also important um, to remember um, that we are workers as well as indigenous people and, and to have in mind that um, we always need respect and um, better pay and better conditions for us as workers as well. Women's struggles continue to this day around the world and in every sector. This, this month of March is also Women's History Month in the United States. For indigenous communities, women, femmes, and LGBTQ2 spirit plus people are at the forefront of all of our struggles, whether that is revitalizing indigenous languages or asserting tribal sovereignty, protecting the land and the water, and the most vulnerable, including our children, elders, and missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two spirits. It's also about protecting everything that's on the land and in the water, whether we're talking about wild rice or fish or buffalo. So we're excited to present today's panel of women who are leaders on many different fronts. My co-chair today is the executive director of the North American Indian Center of Boston, Raquel Halsey Arbona. I turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Matoin. Hello, everyone. My name is Raquel Halsey. Um, my mom's last name is Arbona, which I still use in public spaces. Um, I am a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Urukara Nation, and I am an urban Indian. I grew up in Maryland and then ended up in Boston some years ago. Um, so I am honored to join you from the Massachusetts Territory, whose people, traditions, language, and stewardship continue today through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Um, I am here also because it is so important to me um, being from a, uh, a home led by a single mother, uh, a home led by the elder women in my family that um, you know, we, we have to do more to uplift our, our women, to uplift our young women in particular, to show them that it is um, okay for them to lead, that it is okay for them to um, observe what's going on in their communities and try to make changes and address things that are needed because nobody else is going to do it. It's the women that lead the way. 
So without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce the speakers. Matoi, I turn it back to, to you. Okay, if you allow me. Um, we're gonna start off with Melissa Harding Ferretti. Um, thank you, Melissa, for being with us today. Melissa is proudly in her third term as the elected tribal chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe with a tribal office located in the Cedarville, South Plymouth area of Massachusetts. She volunteers much of her free time to better her community. In her dedicated role as chairwoman, she's worked tirelessly on the many initiatives and challenges that indigenous communities face. Melissa is also the current president of the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project. Some of the work she has dedicated her time to includes, but is not limited to, tribal rights and self-determination, youth empowerment, grant writing, protection of sacred sites and ancestral burial grounds, tribal archival research and digitization, mental health, substance use, addiction, and prevention. Melissa, we're so happy you're here with, with us today. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Natasha Weiss, uh, Melissa Freddy, uh, New Tomas, Sequana Mako Paklet, Ka Natai Patuxet Borndale, Melissa Ferretti. Uh, my name is Melissa Ferretti. I am from the Herring Pond tribe of Plymouth and Borndale. So I'm really honored to be here. And I really wanna thank uh, Matoi and the United American Indians of New England and NICOB for hosting this event. Uh, some of your faces I already know. Noretta, it's so wonderful to see you again. And, and as I said, I'm, I'm really Hi. proud and honored to, to be sharing this space with you. So I guess I'll start uh, from the beginning, right? Uh, a few minutes here. So um, I was raised in Cedarville, as Matoi said. Uh, Cedarville is a small village in the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. We all know um, of Plymouth, Mass, and uh, the atrocities that happened there. So um, I was raised by an elder of my tribe. Her name was Verna Harding. Verna was born in 1905 and she was born in the valley, what we call the valley now, um, which is one of the three um, parcels of reservation lands that were um, allotted uh, post contact, obviously, uh, to the Herring Pond Indians at that time, Herring Pond Wampanoag now. Uh, Verna, um, I always speak of her when I do any of this work because the work and the, the life that I lived being raised by her, my sister Brenda and I were both raised by her. Verna actually uh, throughout history had custody and care and custody of many of the Herring Pond Wampanoag children over time, including my father. So my father being a single dad at the time, my sister Brenda and I, uh, we were so fortunately raised by Verna. And I think about it now, and you know how lucky I was to have had that that life. You know, we we all can look back, and um, Verna had a very traditional household, particularly when it came to food. And we spent our entire life, you know, watching Verna sitting at the picnic table cutting fish. Or herring season was a really big deal. I was probably the only child in the Plymouth Carver school system to have a herring shed in my backyard. And every single season when the herring started running, our sacred herring come through, it was a really big deal. Uh, we always talk about, you know, my sister Brenda and I being really small. And that was that one time where Verna, because she had a tight, tight, you know, whip, whip on you, you know, she always wanted to know where you were. But that was the one time of year when we could go out into the woods and forage. And she'd send us out on these missions to get the herbs and things that she needed to smoke those herring. So I grew up now and I think about how lucky I am that although at that time when I was born in 1968, a lot of these traditions, and obviously we know, had been taken from us. You know, we weren't allowed to be indigenous back then. We weren't allowed to talk about it and do all these things. But I always bring that up uh, because of Verna's strength is really why I'm here today, right? Uh, I, lived, I lived and I learned from her. She was one, um, not just herself, but she was also um, Verna and several of the other women in the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe and some from Mashpee as well that lived on the Herring Pond Reservation um, and maybe others, they were some of the first women to ever work amongst the men at the Quincy shipyard. 
how amazing is that? Um, she did welding alongside the men to make a living. One of the only jobs she might have been able to get back then. You know, we couldn't have jobs maybe in the corporate world like we can today. So I always talk about Verna when I get to the Herring Pond story because her and all of the other elders from that that time, you know, they weren't able to to embrace the the things that we're able to do today. So the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe, for many of you that may not know uh, about us, um, obviously we we were the little tribe in Plymouth. Um, after uh, post contact, the Herring Pond um, Wampanoag people, we were we were allotted uh, three separate parcels at one time. We had one parcel. Uh, most of our land was mostly in Plymouth, but partly in Bourne. Uh, our biggest our biggest lot was called the Great Lot, and that was approximately twenty six hundred acres at one time. Wow, pretty big piece. And our meeting house lot, which was two hundred acres. And our meeting house lot, proudly enough, is where our, our, uh, our meeting house that was is nearly 200 years old still sits today. And against all odds, we still have care and custody of that building today. That was 200 acres. And our, our Herring River lot, where um, we still have family that live on those lands today, was a 400 acres and extended on the backside of Herring Pond all the way through almost to Wareham into Redbrook. So at one time, um, we had quite a bit of, of land that we could forage and hunt and, and, and fish and all of these you know, great things. So I guess if we're to talk about, for me, how did I uh, get back into this work? Um, I think for myself, this particularly, I think loss really leads us into a place where we really become passionate, right? Um, Verna died in 1994 at the age of 89. And, um, Shortly after Verna died, I lost my sister Brenda to breast cancer. So people ask me, you know, what brought you into this work, Melissa? And what it really was, was my commitment to, to my ancestors and my dedication and my need to make my sister and my and Verna and the rest of my elders and people proud. We spent our whole life growing up in those burial grounds. You know, you'd think burial ground is a sad place, but for us, it's a sad place. And we always showed that respect to our, our people that, that were buried there when we were, of course, children. But I remember those days as, you know, those were the times where we gathered every, every time at the same times during the year, the, the, the community would get out over to the burial ground to clean up, do this work, and us kids would run amok on the hills. And the burial ground for me is a place of happiness because those are the places that my people are and those are where my ancestors are buried. And Verna always instilled that into us that, our people were there and how proud she was of that. So um, after losing my sister Brenda, uh, I think I started, it was about 2001. And I just got this fire under me and this tenacity started burning. And I, um, I had started doing some advocacy work. At that time, I was working for Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. I spent um, three years at the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe and really um, got to love a lot of my people there. My stepfather was a, a 15, 15 year or more um, tribal counselor there. So not only did my stepfather was met was a you know Mashby person, my 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 dad was Herring Pond and all of our families intertwined. But I, I took in a lot back then. And it's really when my I, I the fire, you know, really came on to me. And I started doing some advocacy work for um, our indigenous rights to to the to the ocean and to our fish. We had uh, the town of Bourne was allowing us to, you know, allowing us, you know, that's what they call it. But we were asserting our rights under the shellfish, uh, the shell fishing and all of the fishing there. And they were expecting us to pay for a parking sticker. And I had started the work and I petitioned the town of the town of Bourne to allow us to create our own parking stickers. It was a, you know, a big event in town and they are like, oh, you know, the Indians assert their rights to their fishing. And of course, you know, thankfully that, that law passed in the town and they allowed us to create our own parking stickers so that we can go to our fishing spots without having to go purchase a sticker from, from the town. So that was really where it started. And I started really learning about tribal government, um, how things are structured, um, obviously not our traditional way from way back when, but obviously it's something that's been imposed upon us. And uh, we've always had to sort of learn that. So I took, time um, after Brenda passed and did that work and then about um, 
2012, I guess, or so, something just told me I really needed to go back and start attending meetings and listening to the ancestors and the elders and learn what tribal council was doing and really get involved. So that's when I really started going back to meetings, attending meetings. And, you know, I just really saw a need for some help in our tribe to, to build capacity and to grow. So I waited a little, like we always would do out of respect. I took my time, listened, and then I decided a couple of years later to uh, run for a board seat. And that's where it started. I ran for a board seat. I sat on the board for two years. We did a bunch of housekeeping and started talking about, um, you know, fundraising and how we could grow. And that took me to um, a place where we started making some really great progress. And then I decided to run for tribal chair. I was the first woman to ever be elected into that seat. Pretty amazing. And I've been here ever since. It's been a wonderful experience. Um, but at the same time, I'm sure anyone who sat in a tribal leadership role, it could be as big of a challenge as it can be uh, rewarding. We are, uh, we're we live in this corporate world, in this world, um, this patriarchal society that really, you know, pushes us to do all of this work and have this this government that looks like the the, the American government, and it can often be, you know, very frustrating and hard to separate the two, right? So um, here I am today on the third term, and you know, we I feel like. I, I should have started my one regret and I keep saying this is that I should have started this work 30 years ago and you know I feel like I could have made so much prog more progress but I do this work now to leave something for my grandchildren and for my cousin's grandchildren and for their grandchildren and all of those young people to come it can be it can be very difficult uh, with the political part that was just one of the hardest things for me starting out I think uh, but I just forge on and we keep going today. Some of the um, important efforts we have been working on, uh, we have been able to secure some funding, um, something that hadn't been done. And we have um, quite a few projects going on. We have a traditional ecological knowledge project um, on a six acre parcel of land that the town of Plymouth recently handed back to us that we've been working on. That was a pretty, pretty important accomplishment. We have, um, we have started our first recovery support program so that we can start offering uh, office hours in our building. We've received some COVID funding, um, something that, you know, as a state recognized tribe, we are seriously underfunded. We are not federally recognized. So we know that that can really be difficult for us to, to compete in today's society when we, we don't have the resources necessary to do so. But we forge on and we keep going, like I said. Um, done a lot of work in the environmental sector through the traditional ecological knowledge grant. We are working to stop the, the, the dumping in the, the bay by Holtec, the decommissioning, um, trying to put radioactive waste. We have some other initiatives that we're working on to save the Pine Barrens. There's a lot of sand mining and um, other uh, things going on that we feel very strongly are very legal and harmful to our indigenous lands. Um, I know I've done some work with Noretta uh, to try to stop this mega dams from coming through and destroying, destroying tribal land. Uh, we've, work in, we've been working on a digitization project, which is very tedious and takes a long time. It's a lot of research, a lot of work but we are um, working to create a digital heritage website. And it's, in, it's a work in progress, but we've made a significant amount of work in there. It's not launched yet uh, as there's still work to do, but when that's ready, it'll, it will be a very, very important resource for our young people because the digital heritage that, that you find at Mass Historic or um, the American Philosophical Society and all of these repositories are gonna be in one place for our young people and our members and our citizens to be able to access. So it will be a really proud moment when that, um, that is launched and we can share that with our community. Uh, 
I mean, we have a lot going on. So I really thank you all for your time. I wanna make sure there's enough space for my, uh, my fellow panelists to speak. And I, I really thank you all. And I hope to uh, have some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chairwoman, for sharing so much of what you're doing and, and your story of how you came to this. Um, and just real quickly, I just want to um, plus one, uh, the feeling that loss is um, actually a great, a great place of inspiration. Um, and it, it really guides a lot of the work. So I resonated with that term. Um, next, we have Lisa Sakabasin. Lisa is a uh, former member of the NACOB team. So this is especially um, exciting to have her back in this capacity. Uh, Lisa Sakabasin is a citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe and has experience with state, tribal, and federal governments, nonprofits, and philanthropic organizations. In her capacity as the co-CEO of the Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness uh, Organization, Lisa collaborates with tribal leadership, the Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness team, federal and philanthropic partners to address the systemic inequalities experienced by Wabanaki communities in Maine, and develops uh, uh, excuse me, and develops and implements culturally based programs that respond to the needs of their communities. Prior to joining Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, Lisa served as the Director of the Office of Health Equity in Maine, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, as an epidemiologist in the Infectious Disease Program for the State of Maine, as a nurse epidemiologist with the North American Indian Center of Boston, and served as coordinator to the Brigham and Women's Health and Har Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard's Four Directions Summer Research Program. Lisa, take it away. Wow, she willy one to both you ladies, Raquel, Matoin. This is amazing. Giving us space, giving us space to be together. And Chairwoman, it is an honor to follow you. It's also anxiety provoking. So there you are. Your leadership is clear. And your story of loss, of joy, of our elders, as well as passion and service is where I relate to you. Because it's no secret in our communities, we've lost a lot. It's heavy. I think coming out of this pandemic, yes, I feel an abundance of loss, but I also feel an overwhelming opportunity that we're now all in. So first, I'm Lisa Sakabasin. I am from Madotmaguk. I join you from Wabanaki territory, now called Maine, where the home of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy. So where to start? First, I wanna acknowledge this panel. It's an honor to be with you all. Second, I want to acknowledge the stories that we just heard as well as how they are so deeply connected to the story I'm going to share as well as probably the stories that we'll hear afterward. So I spent a lot of time in early on in my career in many systems of oppression, higher education, got that one down, healthcare, got that one down, government, had a lot of experience there, and philanthropy, the very system that essentially provides us resources, but is the result of inequities that we all face. And what I thought then early on in my career, and I'm still learning, trust me, is that those are the places that I needed to be to make a difference. I needed to be in government where the decision makers were. So I could change, perhaps, the decisions they were making. I needed to be in higher education because if I were there to open the door, people would be able to walk in, our people. 
And then I thought, I need to be in philanthropy because we all know how this game goes, don't we? To be able to do the work we wanted to do, the chairwoman talked about the funding she's been able to receive, it's game changing. It allows us to serve in a deeper way. Sometimes meeting basic human needs that shouldn't be there in the first place. So I needed to be in that place too, be in that place of power, if you will. So I could make sure that those resources went to, well, faces like the faces on the screen. And I thought I needed to be in those positions of leadership, in those systems of oppression in order to make a difference in my community. And it's funny to think about it now because I'm not so far outside of those systems. However, to think that those systems of oppression that were never meant to serve us, really on the contrary, were meant to harm us, were actually going to make the difference really made no sense. So it was interesting. It was about four years ago, four years ago this month, actually, my father got sick. My father from Madotmaguk, first language, Passamaquoddy, didn't read English until my mother taught him. My mom helped him get his license. He's from Madotmaguk, his tribal chief, early on in my life, author, musician, historian, language keeper, fluent speaker. My mom, non-native, these were my role models. These were the people I learned from. And when he got sick, I was by his side every step of the way. And he got sick quick. He went right into the hospital and that's where he passed. That's where he transitioned. It was about three weeks that we were able to spend with him. And my father told a lot of stories during that time. He also said to me, if you wanna make a difference, you need to be in community. We already have the answers. We already have the knowledge. We have 10,000 years of connection to what makes us well. That's where you're going to see the difference. So at that time, I took note, but I didn't think I'd make a change. It wasn't until after he passed where I realized that, yes, indeed, I needed to be in community. So Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness was a small organization. I quit my job in philanthropy where I thought all the power was, right? That's how we're conditioned. Conditioned to competition, socialized to scarcity. So all the power is here. Where the reality is, what I learned is all the power is here. It's in the faces and places that we, these faces take up, these places that we call home. And so I joined Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. I made team number seven almost four years ago, it'll be four years in June. My father passed the very end of April. And so I quickly made decisions after his passing. I joined the organization in June. Four years later, I made team number seven we just hired our 127th person. 127 people, 70% indigenous, most of them women. So we grew fast and it wasn't a surprise. It almost felt natural. The power you get when you pull together indigenous people, that passion the chairwoman talked about, 
that she felt she wishes she started earlier for, that passion cannot be stopped. That's what I believe. And you times her by 127? Wow, right? Feel that power. And what's so important about our organization is yes, we're 70% indigenous, but we're also 30% not. That diversity, I believe, is important. I believe that we're here to be together, to figure out the complexity of what we're all going through. And I believe that diversity is needed. I actually think that 30% heals from what we create because what we believe in our organization is that we need to be a healing place. Our responsibility is that you come into employment to serve and to heal. That places of employment, education, healthcare, government, philanthropy, those places have done harm. I guarantee we all have stories on this panel of harm those places have done. And so we need to lead differently. We need to serve the people that are serving, the people we're there to serve. We need to heal within the employment structure. We need to create places of employment that also recognize the power in the people that work there. We also need to stop this conditioning to competition. We are so much stronger together. We also need to stop thinking in this scarcity mindset. It harms us. There is enough. I come from those systems of philanthropy and government to be able to tell you there's more than enough. But we need to take care of each other. And one of the things at the organization that I help to lead that we say is wherever you are in your journey, we have a place for you. There's no more making people invisible. We as indigenous people and women know how that feels. And we can't do that to others. So to be able to have a place for wherever you are in your journey, if you need recovery services, I've got you. If you need a recovery home, I got your back too. If you wanna learn your language, boy, come and have some fun with us. If you have no regalia and you want to make some for you and your family, come on. We have a place for you too. It's about creating sacred spaces to heal, to serve and to learn from each other. So that's the work that I have the honor of being able to do. I am a part of an organization that doesn't have one leader. I am a part of a team. We have a co-leadership structure, a three sisters model, I like to call it. So there's three of us, right? Corns, bean, and squash, they do better together. We know that. And so us three have our areas of expertise. We allow each other to think in each other's lanes, but also to be able to challenge each other too. So I will stop there, Chi Wooliwan. It's an honor to be with you all. And I look forward to hearing from the women after me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Wow, I'm really getting choked up <laughs> listening to people speak today. You know, it it not only resonates with my own experience, but I think it resonates with so many of our experiences. You know, I, I appreciate I appreciate everyone for speaking in a real way. You know, and speaking personally about their process too. Um, our, our our next speaker 
is, well, let me say Tanze to her. Our next speaker is Noretta Miswagon, and she's a member of the Executive Council and a Cree language teacher in the Pimichikamak Cree First Nation that is in Northern Manitoba. Um, Pimichikamak, which is also known as Cross Lake, has been severely impacted by a hydro dam project that has caused their land, some of their lands to be disappeared. It has made the water dirty. It's caused the waters to fluctuate and make it dangerous for the people to be able to hunt, trap, and fish, which is their ancestral way of life. Um, some of you may have heard or met Noretta previously when she and um, some other people from Pima Chickamauk, as well as from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, were here in Massachusetts speaking at National Day of Mourning, speaking at Herring Pond, and speaking at other places about the importance of mega dam resistance, which is something that is happening everywhere. Indigenous people from Chile <laughs> to, to Manitoba to Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador are, are resisting um, these mega dam projects because they are so destructive. So Noretta, thank you so much for being with us today and um, welcome. Hi. Hey, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for asking me to be part of this. I'm learning so much already from the first two ladies that spoke. Uh, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Noretta Maswagen. I am from Pemichikamak territory in a place called, they called Cross Lake, Manitoba, Canada. And I am an executive council member. I was a Cree teacher and I am also a mother. I have six sons and five daughters um, and I have 12 grandchildren. So I, I don't even, I mean, the way you, you other ladies speak, I mean, I, I feel like, but um, I have, I have um, some pic some video to share with you about the destruction of the dam, right on our river, the river that um, and we say ancestors, but um, it's me. It was my mom. It was my grandmother. These are not my ancestors. These are my family that live off of this land, and it's my son. It's my daughters. They're waiting for the goose hunt. I don't know how that's going to go this year. Last year, uh, we had to we had to sit in the mud and wait for the geese, and it was hard getting them um, when we shot them down because the water was so low. But last year, apparently, it was a drought all over Canada. But in, I mean, that's last year. What about the years before? Because be, because before the dam, uh, the water was predictable. the The level of the rivers. They knew, my mom and them knew exactly how high and low the water would be with each season. They knew exactly how to navigate it. And they knew how to, and when I was a child, I mean, we, 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 we speak like, um, it's not even, it wasn't hundreds of years ago. It was yesterday, it's still today that we can't use these waters, that we can't live like how, how we used to live. But we're trying. We're trying to make do with what we have left. The damage is, is significant. It's very, I mean, and then I, as a person in leadership and I see my people, our people, lost and when you change the rivers that were our roads i mean pimichikamak literally means pimichikamak territory pimichikamak means the river that goes across our land so the nelson river they call it we call it kichisipi um it's this river and it goes across our land. So we know that that's our territory. That's, you know, that river marks our territory and we know where it is. So when they put a dam, but there's, I think there's three dams along Gitsisipi now. One, 
wait, we live right beside it. It's called Jen Peg. And um, when you do what you, what they've done to the water, to the river, and you stop it, and it's low and it's high, the people who used it to travel on it, to, to get around, they get literally, literally they're lost because sometimes the water is so high, islands, whole islands have been, have been washed out. All the trees, everything that was on that island, all the plants, animals, berries, medicine, anything that grew there, it, it's gone. I'm not even joking. Whole islands are gone because the water gets so um, deep in some parts. Um, there's pictures. I don't have them. I wanted to look for them, but there are pictures. I have some pictures of the damage. Um, I'll share a video with you of uh, my son who, who's been hunting since he was a child. One year he went to where they go and um, he lost the water. I mean, it's bad. I hope you can see it. It's from, oh yeah. What's wrong, Thomas? The water is literally gone. Like, and like, it's, it's bad, uh, and I have I've saved a lot of posts over the years of uh, people posting about the water, like this one. This is in the winter. This was by a local man named Marcel. This is his trail to his trap line. It's slushy because the the hydro lets the water out, lets the water flow in the in the winter when. It, Student, when when it, it does this, it causes slush to come up, and people traveling to their trap lines, they those are two skittles stuck in the slush. And then when we need it in the winter to be deeper, it's very low. Like it's it's the and we're and here we are trying to live, trying to. There's another one, and like. This is uh, when the water comes up and then sometimes it goes down. So there's hanging ice and slush along the shores. And uh, like the ice falls and it's very dangerous. It's, it's hard to travel and do your hunting, do your, do your trapping, do your fishing. Um, and, it's, and it's every year, it's every year. Um, this past year, we couldn't have our domestic fishing program, so people, the fishermen had to be flown, flown, um, and this was another one by a, a lady, a local lady, who lost a, a son. That, that's our dam, that's Jen Pig, that's the, that's what it looks like. That is, oh, that's, there's supposed to be water, that's sand. And that's in the fall and the water's far. And it's it's crazy how how our water we have and it's and we have no I feel like we have no say. We don't know what the it's it's I can't tell you how. how sad it is. And then we wonder why our people are um, lost and how you know, but we, we keep trying, we keep fishing, we keep hunting, we keep like, we're, we're, getting, we're all getting ready for the goose hunt. Um, my mom and them live without hydro. And they said it, it it was a good life. And when we have blackouts here in Hydro, and everybody gets together. It's dark everywhere. And we get a little bit of, um, I don't know, the life is different with Hydro. I mean, sometimes I feel like I wish we didn't, we never had it. Um, 
but our people are still hopeful because when um remember when uh 2000 the year 2000 came and they said uh that the world was going to end is going to be a blackout worldwide blackout because of the computers or something and i remember people panicking and um my mom and them were happy they said <laughs> they said i wish i wish that would happen and uh I remember this man, this Christian man coming to my mom's house, giving her uh, a big bag of rice and a big bag of flour. And she said to him, what are these for? The lights go out. And she said to him, where is your faith? She said, she said, if the lights go out, because that's the best thing that could happen to us. She said, she said, we'll go back to the land. She said, everything we need to survive is right in our backyards as granted to us by the creator. And um, we get so lost. We get so, you know, when you, when you don't allow people to move, like it all started with, of course, the treaty and then the Indian Act, and then the reserve system, and then the residential school, and then you know the Natural Resource Transfer Act. It, it just took away everything. We, we had um, a, a way, a government, we had everything, and just little by little, everything, it, it's being taken away. It's coming where I mean, as a Cree teacher, I am, and as a leader, I am working on um, a language and culture celebration in my territory. Uh, it, uh, and, and, I, and I need, we need for our people here and over there, wherever you are, we need to teach our children their language um, because I am 49. I grew up, that's all I spoke was Cree. I, I, I knew no other language, I knew no other way. It wasn't until I got into school that I started learning English. And um, I, by, by the time I was growing up, my mom and them, the ceremonies, the sweats and everything, it was outlawed. You were a criminal if you even smudged. You were, it was a crime to have a, so I'm sure you all have the, had the same laws. Um, forced on your people uh so when by the time i was growing up in 1989 there was a, a an education gathering here in cross lake and there was a powwow oh it was a big deal uh we wanted to go as kids we wanted to go but my mom said and she said don't go there don't don't go there and, and i thought I, I thought she didn't like who she was or or I don't I don't know what I, I just thought why would she not letting us and then it was later that I learned it was because it was against the law for her she was a criminal if she wanted to sweat or do a ceremony so I don't know much about ceremony or sweats but I do smudge our, my children and I we smudge as often as we can uh um, okay, where was I going with this? Uh, uh, it was it was a, a crime for them. So with this celebration that I'm planning, um, I, I I think we need, I know we need to teach our children their language. That's where I was going. The ceremony, the sweat. The sweats, the ceremony, like our, the the language is so spiritual. I, I had no idea how, who, I was speaking to or from, when I spoke my language. I didn't grow up with the ceremonies and stuff, but when I speak and I learned to break the words down when I went to school, I had to go to school. <laughs> I mean, it's weird how the two, you know, school and my upbringing where the land where I only knew the language and when the two came together is where I, I learned how 
spiritual, how powerful, how awesome our language languages are. Um, uh, like, I don't know how you in your language say grandmother. We say nokum. Uh, nokum is my grandmother. Kokum is your grandmother. Okuma is his or her grandmother. And in our language, I speak Nenoinoan. Um, Nenoinoan literally translates into uh, speaking from the four directions. And we have, you know, these um, the dictionaries that try to translate our language into English. Not even close. But for uh, for example, um, I don't know how you would say, I mean, but for me, for this is how we say when we're on our time, we say nyukumin. Ne meaning me, nyukum, grandmother, nyukumin. And literally, I mean, simple English translation, menstrual, you know, period. Literal, literal translation, I have my grandmother with me. That's what, that's what we're saying when I say I'm on my time and I say Nyokomen, I have my grandmother with me. And the awesome thing about this is that we refer to the moon as our grandmother. I never knew why. Now I know why. It's because the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle are the same, nearly the same. But I, th I thought that was awesome. And um, I don't know, just simple words like... Uh, I don't know how you say home, but we say Nike. Nike is my home. Kike is your home. Wike is his or her home. Nike Magan. That's a, a simple English translation, wife. Literal Cree translation, Nike Magan, Nike, my home. Magan is some like a, a, you've built it. So Nike Magan literally translate to the one I've built a home in and I'd be like oh my god this language is so awesome so we can see how how men would have a more I don't know because the the relations between men and women are so distorted now than they were before but if you speak the language and you understand what you're saying, then you know how to relate to each other, to the sky, to the earth, to the water. Um, and uh, like this water is it's so, it literally is life. I've had 11 children, but the first kid that I had, I was so scared because uh, my mom, took me to the nursing station and she was so mad, but she didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. She, we got home and she goes, what's that kokum nas? She said, go see your grandma. So I went to my grandmother's and I sat there and I thought, oh my God. And I sat there and, and my kokum looked at me and she said, now better no sim. She said, oh, I've heard granddaughter. I said, oh, she said, I got get skinny taman. She said, I got taman a ski. She said, now you will know how you are related to the earth. Of course, I don't understand. I'm 15 years old having a baby. My face is red. My ears are burning because I'm so, but that's the thing. Anyway, carrying on with this story, um, she said, uh, she said, Kita and she was, you're, 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 you're with child. And she said, I got a gay eye in it. I'm not sure because that life will come out of your body. She was like, I'm not going to get you to be good. I'm not going to get you to be good. I'm not going to get you to be good. And she said, She goes, You were not alone in creating this life. You had a partner. And, and, oh, I can't even. Think that what a what an awesome, awesome, wonderful way. What what more what more of a beautiful way to explain life and the relations between a man and a woman, where the father 
is the sky and the water that comes down goes into the mother earth and then life comes out. But that life in here, that little life in there is only alive and only well and only healthy because of the water in there. And it's the water that makes the delivery much easier. So when I think about the dams here, it's just like in your belly when the water's there, when you're pregnant. If there's something wrong with that water, a child will die or be born with you know, difficulties. And just like the water out there, it was clean, it was good, it was there, it was for, it was, you know, now with the dams, that water is contaminated, it's dirty, it's got poison. And we have to live off of that water. And which explains, which, which makes me see that just as when you're pregnant and the water in your belly is poisoned, so will your child. Look at our people. They're poisoned, they're sick because their water is dirty and we can't live off of it. It's just, a, I mean, this is just a little bit of what happened to our people, just a little bit. I mean, the treaties, I don't think they were ever meant to be, um, to be implemented. I don't know if they meant anything by it, but to take. Um, because as soon as the treaties were signed, then there was the Indian Act that jailed us in on reserves and being jailed on these reserves where you could only use you could only get a pass and you had to be you had to say how long you're gone what you were getting and when you'd be back i think for our women it was bad but i think it was even worse for our men because our men could then not go out as they wanted as they saw fit as they needed to to um, provide. And um, I mean, just look at our men. They're not proud men, not many. And the ones that do try to live off the land are seen as um, uneducated and whatever. But I don't know, it's just a little bit of our lives here. And I'm sure your lives are, this, are, are similar. Your, the loss of your identity is similar. Um, I, I, there's so much more, but um, the dam is just, you know, a kick while we were down already. It just keeps kicking us around, but we will get up. Our kids are way smarter than we are or ever will be. And they're educated, they're being educated. I'm gonna make sure that we teach them as I hope you will teach your children. You know, whatever little language you have, give it to them. I make it a big deal. I'm known as the, you know, creep person here that was put, I push it every day, everywhere I go. Um, so not to take up any more of your time, I, that's what the dams have done to our people. And I hope that, um, I don't think we need any more, you know, if there are any more dams built, it's simply for money. What are we going to do with all this money? I think we should have enough dams so that we have, I, mean, I think when I did some research, there were, the two dams were enough to, um, two dams were enough to provide electricity to all of Manitoba. I think we have 10 dams now in Manitoba and the other seven are simply for export at the expense of people awesome people, awesome, wonderful people that if we were allowed, I mean, I don't know. But um, thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, I hope, any questions, I'll, I'll answer any questions. Thank you for that. That was really powerful and it's always such a special thing to have language 
um, in spaces that we're sharing of ourselves, of our cultures, our tribes, and um, with others. Um, and and I just want to uplift the damage that dams do to communities. Um, on my reservation, the Garrison Dam in the 50s took over 156 acres, and at the time, forcibly removed about 80% of my tribe's population. Um, and growing up, my Ugga, my great grandmother, used to just sit on our porch and look at the water that now and still covers uh, the place where she grew up. And that dam covers um, what was really the most fertile land um, that, that our tribe had. So the impacts are real, the impacts are lasting, the, the loss is lasting, but also the resilience um, and, and the power that, that comes with um, knowing that we, you know, we survive, we persist, and that we continue to teach language like, you're, like you were just saying. So thank you, thank you for that. You're welcome. Next, our uh, speaker, or excuse me, our next speaker is Sharif Whiteland. She is a Diné mother of six. She is the founder of the Le La Vie Camp. Excuse me for butchering that French. <laughs> uh, the camp is located on her land near Rain, Louisiana. Uh, Cherie and water protectors uh, work through direct action to call attention to the inequalities of the Bayou Bridge pipeline that threatens the delicate environment and the health of communities of color along its route. Cherie is also the author of Spill It, The Truth About the Deep Water Horizon Oil Rig Explosion and contributes to bridgethegulfproject.org, the Huffington Post, and several local newspapers. Cherie. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Um, I just, I wanted to start by saying that I am just incredibly proud to be in relationship with these amazing women. Like, you know, um, I think that um, words are powerful. And I, I think that the stories that you've all told here uh, have power and meaning. And I just wanna let you know that I'm going to take those into my heart. And, uh, and I just appreciate you for that, for, for sharing with us. My name is Sharif Whiteland. I'm an Afro-Indigenous mother of six beautiful kids. Um, I'm um, Dene, Navajo. Um, yeah, so my story is a little different because, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up on a res. Uh, my mother was adopted uh, from the Navajo Nation uh, back in the mid-50s. Uh, and where she went, she went to live with... Uh, uh, some white folks and you know they they weren't the great greatest people and uh when she, as she got older she had a lot of troubles you know and then I was born when she was 15 and uh and I went you know I was I was other people raised me I was in care so um yeah it, it I wasn't able to really connect but I did have like one thing that I kept with me first of all I noticed like first people have told had told me that I was native and um I remember being very very young and and when my mom would get me she'd take me to powwows and things like that but when I was very very young before that even I remember just hearing music or sounds and uh and seeing a part of things and just be really intensely like drawn to that um and so and so I so I grew up you know in a way and so uh, and it protected me in some ways because it was kind of you know different you know, and I, I already, I knew who I was, you know, in that way. And um, yeah, so I got her and, and uh, the other way that I felt like I really connected to, uh, you know, native culture is in the way that I felt around like being alone, being in the earth, you know, being uh, in the woods. <laughs> that, that was my favorite, safest place to be, you know. And uh, I felt, you know, really connected to the ground, to the earth, to the water, to like, you know, what was happening around me and the wildlife and to other, to, to animals and things like that. So so I took that with me, but I have to say it wasn't, and, and like I said, I interacted a lot, but, and I would donate, but when it came down to it, what pulled me in basically and pulled me back, what saved me, what I was saving me in was I was working in a, a small town paper in Rain, Louisiana, which is 
oil country. And, uh, and I got invited by BP to go out on, with a lot of other press people to go out on this boat and to see the BP oil spill when it happened. And like I said, I always cared. So I was always like, you know, giving and caring about it. And I've been out to the wetlands oh, so many times. I loved it out there. Um, and that's in Homa territory, by the way. And so, yeah, I went out there with him and got on a boat and it's, it's, either fortunate or unfortunate, depending how you look at it, but we came on a, a very significant amount of oil that BP the weekend before hadn't showed us at all. And uh, when we were driving around, like we, we came across this pelican that was in the water. And um, this pelican was obviously dying, but we were hopeful. And so we, we picked him up and we started trying to go as fast as we could to Fort Jackson where they're cleaning the birds at that time. But at a certain point, we realized you can't go fast in oil. And we decided to, that, the bird wasn't going to make it so they just powered down the boat and we kind of sat and wait and helped this bird to pass and it was then that I really noticed that in a, the wetlands of South Louisiana is teeming with life there's gators there's dolphins there's like you know it's brackish water there's shrimp there's uh, insects and birds so many birds and um, I, felt I didn't hear anything it was completely quiet the only thing I could hear was the sound of this 200 pound Cajun tough dude fall on his knees and start to cry because he didn't know what was coming next. He was fearful and he had his little boy with him and he started crying too, probably because he never seen his dad cry before. So it was a very moving situation. And all I can remember is coming back to the house. It was late at night. The kids were asleep. I went and I, I went to the bathroom to get ready for bed. And I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, I never knew but it's so fragile. Life is so fragile. You know, young people don't know that yet, but it, it could go in a second. And hearing that devastation or not hearing that devastation out there and feeling the impact of this person who just like that lost everything he had in his culture too, you know? I looked at myself and I said, what have you done to contribute to this? And what are you going to do to fix it? And what kind of world are you gonna leave for your kids? And so uh, I started doing a few things. And that's, I guess, how it gets started, right? I, I uh, had a little art show, I wrote a book. I, I, they didn't, they said the uh, BPO hospital was over and it wasn't, people were sick. So I did a walk from New Orleans to DC. Uh, I met with the head of the EPA, all this stuff, you know? And I was really hopeful. There's been a lot of time into it, you know, caring, caring deeply. And it wasn't long <laughs> and I was doing that a few years in that I realized, you know, they don't care. They do not. The only thing they really care about is money. And so, um, yeah, so I changed my perspective a little bit. And I read this book by someone named Diane Wilson. If you get a chance to read it, it's really, really good. It's called uh, The Accidental Activist. And I, like I said, I've been doing this for a few years and I was driving around. And by then I had really reconnected to my roots because Native women in particular, Native people, uh, from our perspective, have been given this land to take care of, and we take the role very seriously. So if you start going out and doing like stuff to help the environment, you're going to bump into a lot of Indians, a lot of natives around, because that's kind of, that's what we do, right? A, a lot of folks, a lot, a lot of folks. And so, um, yeah, I started really connecting, and I started learning a little bit of my language, and, uh, you know, just, just trying to come in a humble way, and be really clear that I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and I learned a lot and I listened a lot to stories and, uh, and time went by. And when I read that book, I remember thinking, oh, wow, I've been a little bit of a coward because I've been doing these great things. Uh, but in the midst of it, the fastest way to go is like d direct action and to be like really strong, like, you know, face that, you know? And so I tried it <laughs> for the first time. I, I stood against BP and they ended up arresting me. And uh, I went through that whole process and everything. And, and then I realized, you know, that got more like support than a lot of uh, the other things that behind the scenes things that we had done. And I believe in the power of nonviolent direct action. I believe in the power of, of, um, of, of conviction, of standing up for yourself. I believe in the power of sacrifice. And so that's what we started doing, you know, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of you know about Standing Rock up there in, you know, in the Dakotas. And um, I, I had went up there, you know, I'd been to lots of other places, of course. And I went up there and it was it was a very special place for the people that were there. You know that. And uh, I came back down and them energy transfer partners that was putting in the Dakota Access Pipeline 
decided to run a pipeline from Texas to Louisiana, and it was running right through the Homa Nation. It was running right through, like straight to the to the to the uh, uh, west side, the Mississippi River, where there was like hundreds of facilities, and then there were communities that lived there that were mostly black communities that were mostly like freed slaves. That actually, walked across the river and and got their own space, you know. So we went to work, and and I believe in relationship organizing, and so we started just talking we listened and we we listened and we listened and we went home to home and we went all the way down the line to that pipeline and we talked to allies in other places we got into the petitions we went to the legal way but when it really came down to it it was louisiana they were going to get that permit so we went to the uh when we what happened was i was driving one time i was doing canvassing and i, I was driving along the route and i look at this i see this property and it's like 11 acres and the pipeline was set to go straight through it and I thought, man, like me and my, my friend, like we were a, a group of five indigenous women. I was like, we really have been talking about having a place where we could do like just transition work and mutual aid work because we have climate disasters all the time. And uh, and so I, I went to some friends and I said, hey guys, you know, I really think this would be a, a great place for that. But problem is there's a pipeline going through it. And everybody like pitched in, we donated all together and, and the Course Foundation and other groups got together and we bought the land. And when we bought the land, the, nobody knew anything. They had already put the flags up for the pipeline. We invited the people whose land it was, which is the Atakapa Ishak people of South Louisiana. Uh, we, we, we had ceremony with them and we asked them permission to work and fight and build from this land, which we were granted. And, um, and then the next thing you know, um, the, we did prayers. We did prayer ties all around the property and we prayed for days and the that Monday, the pipeline company came through and said, we're not going, we're not doing this. We're going around you, like, you know, whatever. So now we have this beautiful prime piece of property. And we like, you know, we, we bought our, our fight. We, um, we, we ended up having to do direct action. We, we had fun with it. We had like Crawfish the Musical, where we like went out on the, on the thing and stood in the way, but made it fun, you know, because we knew where we were, you know, and, uh, you know, we had to deal with the KKK, we had to deal with the cops, we had to deal with the politicians, we had to deal with, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and yeah, yeah. So when the pipeline fight was over, we still had this piece of property and we turned it into a food forest for environmental justice communities from our territory, like, you know, from the, the Western part of Louisiana all the way to the East side. So we actually were able to leverage the struggle itself. Now, a lot of people will tell you, you know, that, that campaign was a good campaign, but we lost. And I just say, those people just don't know. We were able to get that bayou bit, that uh, by the uh, pipeline, Indian Bayou, which is in South Louisiana. We got that 11 acres. It's a growing uh, food forest now that's feeding people all over South Louisiana. We also do climate disaster from that space. And we have organizing within that space and outreach. Uh, but at the same time, like I told you, we had to fight with a lot of bad folks. So it really got kind of intense. At one point, somebody beat my ass. Like, you know, they, oh, sorry, they, <laughs> they, they beat me up. And I knew at this certain point, like, man, I got to get my kids out of here, you know? So we came home, we went to Northern New Mexico, you know, um, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's been beautiful. It's been amazing. But to do that, we had to, I, I'm, not, I'm not rich, I have no money. So I, we had to take the property that we had, the Indian Bayou property. And like I said, we had leveraged the fight for that property. We leveraged that property uh, with the bank to get another property. And then we raised the money to pay off that property. So now we have this space in Northern New Mexico. You know, hold on, hold on to your seatbelts. So what we did with that space was, I got to take it. When I got done with this, I was wiped out. I was exhausted. I, 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 it was burnout, burnout 101. And uh, we start, we opened up this space then and we have had 40 activists come through here and they get to rest. It's a secure space. There's not, you know, there's no drama here. It's very rural. And, uh, and we're building here in, in, in our own space and, and we still have the space in Louisiana. And so all that's to say, what's failure? I think that it gets in the way quite often where people think that they have to come up with some kind of win and they only make one, one victory, one victory, stopping this, stopping the pipeline, right? Or doing this or, or one victory, like, you know, helping uh, kids that are in the system or one, big, but it's not like that. All you're doing from my perspective is we're building stairs, right? That's what it feels like. We're building steps, okay? And those steps that we build, no matter what we do, whether we win or lose or whatever, other people will come behind us and step on those to go higher. 
any action you take to protect the earth or to revitalize the language or to or to you know reconnect with your culture or reconnect with family it doesn't matter if you win or lose there's no goal of course there's a goal but it doesn't matter because you are never going to know what legacy you give to this world we were not meant to know that all we know is we do good work and we move forward right tell you something when you remember that crawfish thing i was telling you about that little uh, thing out on the easement well uh it was a, a whole musical it was really fun we did a way to blast you know but sometimes these these oil workers they would stop and not all the time they would stop and watch this musical and it was really it was cute we had costumes and everything and uh i was reading and i was reading years after we lost that battle uh i was reading uh, an article and i was about uh how solar energy was really making an uptick in louisiana and one of the people that started a new solar company was an oil worker a pipeline worker actually and in the article he had a quote and he said that he was on the pi a pipeline once and they had a bunch of protesters come out there and they put on a whole show with crawfish and everything right and i remember those shows because people would clap afterwards you know we had talented people and uh, he said that he saw that and he thought to himself, wow, that's really creative. Like, it's really good. And then he's like, Man, how can I be more creative in my, like in what I'm doing, you know, for the earth? And he started a deep, deep uh, solar company, a solar panel. Now, I didn't know that. Man, that wasn't what I was going for. I was just trying to stop the pipeline from going through where I live, you know? My point is, you don't get to see it. All you have to do is just do the work and push forward and have and you be in a good way, you know, and be respectful for people and build relationships and understanding you're just building stairs, man. Like all of our ancestors, you know, they never, nobody ever won. <laughs> you know, it was like we got little stairs and you and I are standing on top of those stairs. And our job is to create more stairs towards justice, towards peace, towards um, uh, <laughs> getting our land back would <laughs> be great you know uh so that's my that's my spiel i just gotta say uh thank you so much for letting me paddle on and and uh just just know that uh courage breeds courage so whatever it is in your life or in your organization or in your in your fight try to have courage and other people will see that and it fills them up and they will take action too and that's what we want just build your stairs Thanks. Thank you so much, Sherry. Wow, this has been incredible. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we will get to some. Before, before we do that, um, I wanted to acknowledge that tribal chair of the Massachusetts, uh, excuse me, that um, Elizabeth Solomon from the Massachusetts at, Wampa, at, at Ponkapog. I'm sorry, I can't talk because I'm like been crying and thinking about stuff and everything. So let me gather myself a bit. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that Elizabeth Solomon from the Massachusetts at Ponkapog, who are the host nation in the Boston area, is on this webinar. Um, and also that Brittany Wally from the Nipmuc tribe is here with us and also other tribal members from um, the place that is now called Massachusetts. So we want to thank you for being on with us today. You know, listening to all you speak, I was thinking about how um, often we try to set a different model for leadership. We're kind of all brought up within these colonial systems of what leadership means and that leaders are special and more important than anybody else too. And that there's certain ways to lead based on these Eurocentric ideas of how people should lead. And um, it's always interesting to me to hear about how, um, you know, different Indigenous women who are in positions of leadership um, have been trying to decolonize that leadership and everything that they're doing. You know, we come from so many different places. We come because we care about our children so much. We come because we care about our elders so much. We come because maybe we grew up seeing our elders cry because they didn't have enough food to feed their families with. I know a lot of us from my generation certainly experienced that. You know, we come to this because we we want to protect our our land and our water, and we want to be able to connect everything together because we understand that the land and water and everything there is part of our bodies and part of our lives in such a deep way. We come because we want to 
repair and rebuild our communities that have been so devastated by colonization. And very often we also have an attitude that it's about doing the work. A lot of times women come to leadership, even with having a lot of response, family responsibilities and working and all the other things that we do in our lives, because we see this need and we step up for it and we do the work. It's not, it's not, to me, it's not about leading, it's about doing the work. And, 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 it, and all of the work is important. And the work is important if you have a social and somebody does the cooking and somebody sweeps up and somebody serves. All that work is equally as important as organizing the social. And I think we as Indigenous people and as in, Indigenous women feel that and acknowledge that because too often a lot of the work that we do is not acknowledged and not appreciated. It's not considered as important. So, um, you know, I, I you, you all have really inspired me a lot today. Um, so I wanted to thank you. Um, Raquel, do you want to um, just try to toss out a couple of questions? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's fine. We've gone over the time limit and we don't care because we just want to be able to get some questions out there and hear some more of your beautiful words um, from the four of you and, um, you know, really take a lot away from what we've done today. Sure. Um, and and I, I also just want to say, I, you know, I'm in such awe of, of each of you and, and the work that you have done um, and are doing so that younger uh, Indigenous women leaders like myself can come into um, positions where, you know, we can continue that work. Um, I, I hope uh, we have enough time for each of you to offer one or two pieces of advice for Indigenous women leaders. And if you don't mind, Chairwoman, I'd like to start with you. Oh, thank you. It's been a real honor listening to everyone. And I think for myself, the biggest piece of advice that I would give is just to always have an open heart because as Matoi said, sometimes you really feel like you're, you're unappreciated, right? And you're not acknowledged, but every day you get up and you do the work, no matter what, what it is you're doing, as long as you're doing it, with the right mindset, it's important. Um, it can be a tough world out there, especially when you're in, you get into the political part. And we don't always feel like we're doing a good job and we're not perfect as leaders and we're not supposed to be, you know? I wasn't born and raised into a tribal chairwoman. I, I came here with a need to make a difference and to leave something behind and to try to help. So um, the best advice I could give would be to just do, do what your heart tells you, regardless of the, the pushback or the feedback you might get. As long as you're trying and you're out there and you're, you're, you're showing your face and you're showing up, you know, that's half the battle. We're not all perfect. We're not supposed to be perfect. And um, just try your best. and. You hope every morning that, you know, even the, the struggles you might have, you just hope for one, one other thing that might make up for that. And that's how I try to, to work. Um, yeah, so just, just, just lead with an open heart and nobody can take that from you. Um, that's really what counts. Thank you. Lisa? Wow, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I'll start there. Um, advice, that's a big responsibility. And perhaps that's my message, that we come here with the set of responsibilities. And I'll take some of the language that we just heard. We came here to build a set of stairs or some steps right? Thank you for those words, by the way. Um, they struck me because it reminds me about why we are here. It's about responsibility. It's not about rights. And we hear a lot about our rights. 
and sometimes get really self-righteous about our rights. And I think the message for you know, non-Indigenous people is, is really thinking about those responsibilities. You know, in our work at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, we talk often about our healing comes from the land. And while our healing comes from the land, and yes, land back is certainly a part of that, we also have responsibilities to her, to our earth, to our mother. Our responsibilities is she will heal us if we also are living to heal her like a person. And so that's, I think, the takeaway I'm thinking about are the responsibilities we all have to build those stairs, the responsibility to our mother, and the responsibility to our healing, to being with each other, to being in these circles, in these sacred spaces that allows us to have these conversations, to share these stories. It's powerful. There's healing in this. And so it is hard. I don't think the creator intended it to be easy. It's supposed to be hard and we're supposed to be together. We're supposed to be beside each other. Sometimes beside, sometimes in front of, sometimes behind. Whatever our role is at that time, but our role is always to be together, to come together and travel through this journey, the complexities that are here. But that's what I would say. Where are our responsibilities? It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be hard. And we're supposed to be together. So Chi Willy one, just big thanks to both of you ladies who brought us together today. It was exactly where I was supposed to be on a Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Noretta? Hi. Oh my goodness. Um the boys I can ask me now, I can always call it an ask me now again to me. Um I I said I thank you and all the women on the panel and thank you for making me a part of it. I am truly honored. Um thank you. Uh, in all humility, thank you. I mean, you women have opened my eyes. I mean, it's not about rights, it's about responsibility. I'm going to take that thank you, um, at least. And I hope I get to see you, Chairwoman, again. Um, advice. Um, let us never forget on who we should truly count on to ask to do not let's not forget that our strength comes from a creator that our guidance comes from the creator every day we ask the creator to guide us every day to our responsibilities and means take care of yourself because if you're not well, then how are we going to help our, our people? So thank you again. Take care of yourselves. Trust in the creator. And thank you. And I hope we can, I hope I get to meet some of you in person in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sherry, I'm going to have you close us out with pieces of advice for Indigenous women leaders? Um, yeah, I would say um, 
Well, first of all, if you want to follow my work, you can go to Movement Training Network on Facebook or um, anywhere like that, or just you can get a hold of me, email me if you know you need anything from me or whatever. I would say um, to to Native women, just find joy in your life. I mean, when it really comes down to it, like I said, we're building stairs. We're not here to necessarily win, <laughs> but we are here to fight. But we're also here to, you know, en enjoy, enjoy living. And um, I always say, like, if you can't find uh, joy in the fight, then it's just really not worth it. Like, go spend some time in nature and turn off these devices and and just be happy. Love your kids. Love your life. If you don't have kids, fine. Love that. You know, go out, have fun. I'm only saying that because sometimes you can get so mired down in, in, um, in doing this kind of work or just holding so many people in our hands and uh, that our, our, our arms get tired and that's okay. It's okay. If you need help, get help. Uh, if, you, if you need to just go take a break, take, I tell you, nap and water. That's my favorite thing to say. Nap and water cures most things. It does. Um, just be good to yourself. We need you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so inspired. I'm so full of gratitude. Um, I, I, you know, I, I never know what to expect when we're coming into these um, spaces where we are bringing together folks from so many different backgrounds um, and different experiences, but there are so many things that are shared. Um, and and uh, there are so many things to uh to learn from each of you and you know I'm, I'm i'm going to be thinking of each of these lessons that i've learned from you um not only today but through the rest of the week and 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 let um all of your words just just guide me in in this work so thank you so much um for our folks who are still hanging uh hanging in there I am going to invite you to check out our website where we're going to continue to um, post the videos after each of these sessions. And there you can also find uh, up-to-date information on some of the next sessions that are coming. And, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's going to be a very exciting year. It already has been. We've been able to uplift so many people, so many women, and we're not gonna stop. Matoi? Yeah. Um, I'd also like to invite everybody to um, check out the UAINE website, which is updated sometimes. And the, <laughs> the Massachusetts Indigenous Agenda website, which is updated a lot. I, the Massachusetts Indigenous Agenda website is maindigenousagenda.org. And the reason that I'm asking you to go there and take a look is because we have information there about all five of the bills that are currently before the Massachusetts State Legislature and um, information about what you can do to help get those bills passed because the legislature has not been doing a good job of listening to indigenous people. And we really wanna change that um, and get the bills passed. We have bills to ban mascots, uh, a bill to uh, have Indigenous Peoples Day in place of Columbus Day, a, a bill that did not make it out of committee to provide for uh, Native curriculum and all the public schools in Massachusetts, K through 12. Unfortunately, that didn't get out of committee. A bill to protect sacred Native heritage, and last but not least, a bill to improve educational outcomes for indigenous students here in Massachusetts. We also um, invite you to go to our uh, Facebook groups, the, the NACOB um, page and the UAINE Facebook group where we, we both post lots of news and information about upcoming events and news from all over um, indigenous territories worldwide actually, not just um, here. Um, just a couple of announcements. One is that there is, if you don't know, um, Melissa referred to it briefly, but um, the, the whole tech company has been threatening to dump thousands of gallons of radioactive water from the decommissioned Plymouth nuclear power plant. It's called the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. Pilgrims are never good news, I should add. And they are threatening to dump radioactive water into the, into the harbor, into Cape Cod Bay. And 
people have been organizing to stop that from happening. So if you are in the region anywhere near Plymouth, there are events happening all the time around this. Um, tomorrow, Monday at 5.30, um, there is going to be a gathering outside Plymouth Town Hall at 5.30, and we invite you to get involved with that and any, any of the other um, incredible organizing things that are happening all around Massachusetts that are being led by Indigenous people. Um, so uh, are there any other upcoming events, Raquel, or? Uh, nope, that is it. <laughs> all right. Th thank you to you all. This, is, this has been beautiful. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, Kamash. Thank you so much. Until again.